I'm Eric. Um, I work for CCT Data Science Group um, and with Jessica and Christina. And my background is in chemical ecology, um, uh, plant metabolomics, plant responses to herbivores, a few things that people have mentioned, um, and also a little bit of plant demography stuff. Um, so cool. And part of the reason why I wanted you to all to introduce each other is because we're definitely going to have some time today for some discussion. And, um, you know, if there's a, a particular question that you have about your research that is something really specific, um, maybe somebody else here in this group can uh, help you out or point you in the right direction. Um, yeah. So what we're going to do today uh, let's see, let me get my slides up here. Y'all see my slides? Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit and we're going to feel free to interrupt me at any time with questions or anything. I'm going to talk a little bit about stuff, going to show you some things, and then uh, we're going to have some time to play around with our code a little bit um, and uh, learn how to do some uh, specific kinds of analyses in R. Um, these are kind of the, the learning objectives for today. And it, it's, I realize this is a very ambitious list. Um, and if you remember, you know, if we, if we get half of these things, we'll be doing a really great job, um, I think. So I want to talk about kind of, you know, multivariate data. What is it? When to apply multivariate analyses? Um, and the big one that I really want, hope that you come home with is understanding the difference between a supervised and an unsupervised analysis and kind of kind of when to use those things. Um, be able to interpret some of the plots that we commonly see associated with multivariate data. Um, and along the way, we're going to learn how to install an R package from Bioconductor, which maybe you haven't done before and is a little bit funky. Um, how to find help for certain functions in R. And then, yeah, we're gonna actually implement a couple methods in R. What we're not going to do today is we're not going to cover uh, the math behind multivariate analyses. We're not going to cover, you know, probably the specific analysis that you want to use, unless it happens to be one of the examples I've chosen. We're not necessarily going to cover how to know, like, from your specific data or your field, what method to use. Um, so we're going to try to be a little bit more general than that and give you some helpful things to think about and then give, you know, a specific example that will hopefully be a useful starting point. Um, but, but we have two hours and like, you know, we, we probably won't take the two, whole two hours, but, but I'm just saying like, you know, you could take a whole semester long class on multivariate statistics and I'm, I'm not here to teach that whole semester class in, in, a, in this short period of time. Um, so first off, like what is multivariate data? Um, and essentially it's just when we've measured many things on the same sample or observation. Um, and there's actually two things going on here. We have, when we have sort of, multi technically, when we have multiple response variables, um, this is multivariate data. And that would be things like, how is species composition impacted by controlled burns? Um, and so in this case, species composition, is our response. And it's not just one variable, it is many variables, right? It's as many variables are the, as are our species. And maybe the, the, the observation, the rows of this data set, the observations are like just whether it exists or not, or maybe their abundance values, or maybe their area uh, that they, they take up in the, on the forest floor or something like that. Or how are plant metabolites impacted by herbivory? Plants make hundreds, thousands of metabolites. Um, and so this is a multivariate problem. Or how does some treatment um, affect the gene expression of an organism? Um, technically, when we have multiple predictors, this is called multivariable data or multivariable analysis. And so this would be like, how does species composition affect ecosystem productivity? Where now the response variable is ecosystem productivity, which is one thing. Um, and our predictors are species A, species B, species C, et cetera. Or how does plant metabolite blend affect whether a plant gets eaten or not? And our response here is you know, binary. It gets eaten or doesn't, something like that. Um, but in practice, 
both of these things are often called multivariate. And I think that's fine. Um, this paper that I'll, I'll give a reference to at the end, um, they argue that it's, that it's not, <laughs> um, but, but uh, uh, I think it's okay to uh, call them the same thing. And by the way, I just remembered, I'm gonna paste the link to my slides here in the chat in case you wanna follow along um, because you can click on things and yeah. So multivariate data presents challenges and that's why there are this whole field of you know, multivariate analyses. Um, and so first of all, just handling multiple response variables. Um, variables are often strongly correlated with each other and not fully independent. So plant metabolites, for example, right? If we wanna um, look at a bunch of plant metabolites, well, often many of those metabolites are from like the same metabolic pathway. And so they're not really fully independent. And this is a situation called multicollinearity, which can cause problems for like a traditional regression analysis. Um, we also often encounter the situation where there's more variables than observations. And so a lot of people are like, wow, I've got like this amazing big data set and it's gonna be great. I'm gonna have so much statistical power. And, but actually they have like many, 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 many variables and few observations. And so that's actually, um, a, a challenge, not a not a strength of that data set. And this is sometimes called the curse of dimensionality, where right? it's like you feel like you have an amazing data set, but actually the more variables you have, kind of the more observations you need to pull information out of that. And there's also the challenge of how to determine the importance of individual variables. So oftentimes, even though our data are multivariate in nature, um, we do want to know something about which which specific variable is important? So, you know, which species is it, uh, or which species, uh, multiple species, uh, are the ones that respond the most to a controlled burn treatment? Um, not just does the composition change, something like that. So, rather than struggle and try to give you guys these discipline-specific um, examples for for every thing I talk about and try to like hit every sub-discipline that you guys mentioned. Um, we're gonna use this data set about cupcakes and muffins, about baked goods as an example. So this is a sample of 30 cupcake and muffin recipes that I scraped from allrecipes.com. And I've removed the frosting of course, because frosting is a big difference between cupcakes and muffins. But basically I wanna answer the question, are cupcakes and muffins really different or are cupcakes just, are muffins just an excuse to eat cake for breakfast, right? Are they actually different things? Um, this data set has 40 ingredients that I've pulled out and standardized the units in cups, in US cups, um, although that's not necessary for multivariate data analysis. We can have variables being in different units, it's totally fine. Um, and you can think of the ingredients for each recipe like, species in an ecosystem or gene transcripts in a, a yeast cell, chemicals found in a plant, uh, OTUs, you know, my microbial quote unquote species in a Petri dish, whatever works for you. So like, think about that analogy, what the ingredients are, cement that in your mind for the next little while. Um, and you can think of the sort of type, whether it's a cupcake or muffin, as whatever treatment or site or difference, whatever fits your discipline. So set up in your brain right now that sort of translation from cupcake ingredients to whatever your problem is. Um, okay, so to get the data set, I apologize, this is a very long URL, but if you want to follow along, you can open up our studio, open up a new script or our markdown document. And you can, um, on these slides, if you have them open, there's a little clipboard over there, although it's overlapping stuff. You can click on that to copy things um, and you can paste that into R. And I'll also paste that little bit into the, the chat window. Um, and, you know, I missed something in here. This read underscore CSV function is from the read R package. Um, or tidyverse package you can load. So you might need to load a library there if you wanna 
will follow along. Um, but there'll be time for kind of playing with the R code a little bit later uh, as well. Um, so if you want to just watch for now, that's okay too. I just want to show you the data set. So every row is a different recipe. Uh, and so here's the recipe ID. Unfortunately, allrecipes.com has changed their URL scheme since I made this data set. Used to be able to copy this number and kind of like paste it into one of their URLs and see the actual recipe, which was kind of cool, uh, but they don't work anymore, unfortunately. Um, but we see here, I said 40 columns before, but um, in this uh, small subset, there's actually a uh, few ingredients that don't appear in any recipe. And so I've removed those for us because they don't make sense for us to analyze those. So we have things like baking powder, uh, baking soda, butter, buttermilk, chocolate, eggs, vinegar, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So one way that we can kind of divide multivariate analyses um, is by unsupervised versus supervised. And this is something I mentioned in the beginning that I want, want to try to drive home. So unsupervised analyses, um, which are also called unconstrained analyses, often in community ecology, um, these are analyses that are exploratory. They find axes that find the variation in the data. And we can think of these kind of like a single-sided equation. There's no dependent or independent variables. There's just, there's just the data. Um, and so how this works, imagine a simple case where we have three variables. And these three variables we can visualize as axes in space, in three-dimensional space. And we've got points, a cloud of points. Um, and every one of those points exists at a particular location and variable in each of these three variables, right? And gives it a, a three-dimensional place in that cloud of points. And so an unsupervised analysis is one that draws a line through that cloud of points, uh, through the spread of that point. So if we imagine it like a football shape, we're drawing a line from tip to tip of the football, and it's explaining the variation in those data. And then we can draw a second line that's perpendicular to that first one that explains the uh, second greatest amount of variation in that cloud of points, and a third line that explains the third, the most third greatest amount of variation. And then we can rotate those axes um, and project our points on, say, the first two. And we get a plot that looks something like this. And so this is, um, for example, what principal component analysis kind of does. And um, we can see in this example, I've color coded these points. These could be our cupcakes and muffins or whatever analogy you've kind of put in your head. Um, and in this case, you know, they're they're not separating out really along this first axis. They are separating out a little bit along the second axis. Um, a supervised method, on the other hand, is something that's attempting to be explanatory. And it's a method that's going to be finding axes, not that explain the variation in the data, but axes that best separate the data along some other variable. So if it's this sort of binary, cupcakes versus muffins, maybe it's drawing a line that best explains the separation between those two in three-dimensional space in this example. Or it could be a continuous variable, and it would be then kind of drawing a line that kind of best matches whatever gradient that you're thinking. Um, and again, then we rotate that axis over here, and now we see something really different, because in this contrived example, I've set it up so that the separation between the red and the blue points is along a very different set of variables than the spread of the data. It's the exact same cloud of points in these two slides. We're just drawing a different line. And so this line um, shows um, a very different kind of picture in me rotate it and project those points. And so this is a three-dimensional example, and that's about as, as, as big as your brain can sort of visualize or I can draw on, on, a, on a slide. But if we scale that up to, in the case of our cupcake and muffin data set, like 30 variables or whatever, right? We have a 30-dimensional data set and every point, every recipe exists in 30-dimensional space um, somewhere on there. And we wanna simplify that down um, so that we can, you know, draw something like this and project our points onto, say, the first two axes. 
So I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to show you the results right now, and then we'll go back and look at the R code and talk a little bit more about how we get this. But here's the results of an unsupervised analysis of our cupcake muffin data set. And so this is principal component analysis, which is probably one of the most common unsupervised multivariate analyses you'll encounter. And I'll walk you through this. On the left, we have what's called a score plot. Um, and this shows the location of those points along these new axes. And so PC1 stands for principal component one, PC2, principal component two. In PCA, the axis always, um, the first axis always explains the most variation in the data. In this case, it's 13.4%. And the second axis, the second most, and so on and so on. Um, and so that's what these percentages are. It's how much variation in the ingredients list is explained by that axis. So 13.4% might not seem like a lot, but that's pretty high, um, especially if you're you know, dealing with like ecological data, you know, 13%, hey, not bad. Um, and then we have a cumulative R squared down here that says with five, if we go out to principal component number five, we've explained about half of the variation in the data. Um, on the right, we have a correlate. Oh, Jessica, you have a question? Yeah. Yes, I do. Um, so I've seen a lot of these before, and I, I guess I didn't realize until you'd pointed out that very important difference between supervised and unsupervised, that this is through both sets of points. This is just the 13.4% PC1 is That's right. where the most variation is across both. That's right. In fact, PCA doesn't doesn't know. I don't put any information about whether yeah, the recipes are cupcakes know. or muffins into PCA. It, just it is totally agnostic to that. It's one big cloud of points. It's you happen to color them red and blue. I but... painted them after the fact, but the the method, okay. the statistics, the math doesn't care whether they're cupcakes or muffins. It doesn't even know if they're cupcakes or muffins. So okay, so it has no yeah, it's got, it's got no sense of your kind of predictor variables. It just knows that in multidimensional space some combination mm -hmm. of your um, many dimensions explains the most yeah. variation. And then the second axis is the orthogonal second, or Yeah, the perpendicular orthogonal, yeah, perpendicular to, the first. to that. Oh, okay. Uh, colors is completely arbitrary on here. The colors, yeah. And we could, yeah, we could color I mean, these different ways like, potentially. Exactly, yeah. Um, thanks, good question. Uh, Tomas has a qu uh, Thomas has a question. Yeah, go for it. Oh, sure. So <laughs> I just wanted to quickly make sure because I I'm, I'm trying to understand PCA um, mm -hmm. since a couple of weeks. And so the only thing I am struggling with because I know how it's built, but uh, PC1 and PC2 is actually um, our first and second dimension. So it's like a first row with multiple variables against the second row with multiple variables. Um, right. So if I want to go like for all of my um, uh, all of my rows, like I mean, that are like displayed on the like on on my on my in my first column, then I have to go like for PC three, PC four, PC five, and so on, and so on, right? Yeah. So principal component analysis it creates as many axes as you have variables. So there's actually I think there were something like thirty one variables in this original one. It creates thirty one principal components. This particular R package that I've used has some logic in it to decide how many of those principal components you really need to keep and really, really explain, really explain a, a decent amount of variation to be worthwhile looking at it. And it's decided that five is the correct amount. Right. Um, so just to clarify, say I have like 30 different species of something, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then on in the first row, I have multiple variables. Then which of these species is it taking for to plot PC1 and PC2? Is it taking all of these species or just yes. two? Yes, all of them, but in different combinations. And that's what this second plot here is going to show us. So with a score plot, you often see that next to either a loading plot or a correlation plot. They're very similar. The axes are a little bit different. In a correlation plot, these are how... Um, how these axes here, PC1 and PC2, how they correlate with your original variables. So for example, 
PC1 here is has a positive correlation with baking powder. So recipes that are further to the right over here are the, gonna be recipes that have more baking powder in them. Recipes over here are gonna have less baking powder in them. Um, milk is over here, positively correlated also. Um, and then over here, we've got things like cream cheese and baking soda um, and sour cream. So these are gonna be in, in higher amounts in the scores that are on the left uh, compared to the ones that are on the right. And then correlated with the second axis, we have things like um, salt, oats, spice, uh, oil that are positively correlated to um, this axis. So points that are up here are gonna have more of those things. And they're pretty strongly correlated, right? Like 0.8 here is, is the, that's the correlation coefficient. And then down here, things like butter, sugar, chocolate, other is like a, you know, a catch-all category for like weird stuff like bacon and, you know, people put weird things in, in cupcakes um, <laughs> that are captured down here. And these things are going to be negatively correlated with this axis. So these axes actually represent combinations, um, linear combinations of your original variables. And in some cases, in sort of the ideal case, you can look at these axes and you can give them a name. And so I'd actually, if there's anybody in here that um, is familiar with baking, um, has any idea why we have baking powder, milk um, on the right here, and then on the left we have baking soda, and then things like yogurt, sour cream, uh, cream cheese, and I think, I don't know, fruit, fruit juice is over here, never mind. Um, anybody have any guesses, any baking experts? Why do we have this axis with baking powder on one side and baking soda on the other? Leah? Because if you're using baking powder, you generally don't need baking soda. And then if you're, if you're using milk, then you wouldn't uh, generally need also yogurt or sour cream. Yes. And the, yeah, I think that is it. That is, uh, that is part of it. I think my hypothesis, the other piece of it is that um, baking powder has, uh, is baking soda with a powdered acid in it. And so my guess is, in addition to what you just said, Leah, that if we use milk, we probably aren't also using yogurt, is that the ingredients over here are more alkaline or more, more neutral. And so we need an acid. And if we have things over here, like sour cream and cream cheese and yogurt, those are going to be acidic. And so we can get away with using baking soda. Um, some recipes have both, obviously. But we can maybe call this a axis of leavening system, right? So we're going to call PC1 the leavening system. It's a continuum from straight baking powder on one side and straight baking soda on the other side. Um, and then these recipes in the middle, maybe use a little bit of both, something like that, right? But we can name this axis, and that is an ideal situation for PC1. PC2, what would we name that maybe? If we look at the things here. Um, saturated versus unsaturated fats? Yeah, I think this is kind of a healthiness axis, right? Where we've got like <laughs> healthier stuff up here, vegetables, fruit juice, fruit, oats, right? And down here, we've got like sugar, honey, chocolate, butter. Um, so we've got a healthiness axis. And so maybe we are actually interested in those axes, and then we could use those axes to kind of ask a question about cupcakes and muffins. Are they different in their leavening systems? I would look at this and say, no, there's a, they're, they're not really separating out along PC1. Are they different in their healthiness axis? Maybe a little bit, with muffins tending to be a little bit healthier than cupcakes. But there's a lot of overlap. Um, and I haven't done a test here. A common thing that people do, and probably too common, is take these values um, and plug those into a regression. So they would say, you know, is is cupcake or muffin is the type of baked good predicted by values of PC1 and PC2, and do you know an ANOVA type analysis on it? We could do that. But let's take a look at the supervised analysis. So in this example, I've used a technique called partial least squares discriminant analysis. 
don't worry about that for now. We'll we'll talk a little bit more about it in the R code and stuff to do it later. But here we've got something very different. P1 is our predictive axis that now explains only 9.4% of the data. But down here, we've got another value, R squared Y. This is how much of the variation in cupcake versus muffin in the, the baked good type that it explains. And that's 83%. So this predictive axis is not explaining very much of the variation in ingredients, but it is very good at explaining whether something's a cupcake or a muffin. Um, the second axis in this case is orthogonal and it's um, explaining variation that's not related to being a cupcake or a muffin. And it's explaining about nine and a half percent also. Interestingly, it's explaining more variation in the data than our predictive axis. So that's something that's different about this. But this, again, is a score plot, and we can pair it with a correlation plot to figure out kind of what these axes represent. And the thing that sticks out the most, to me at least, in this um, plot is that vanilla is way over here. Um, and that is on the cupcake side. And again, if you're a baker, I think this might make sense because vanilla is a strong predictor, it's telling us is a strong predictor of cupcake, uh, something being a cupcake. Why didn't it show up in the other plot? Well, that's because whenever you add vanilla to a recipe, it's always one teaspoon. It's, it's never anything else than one teaspoon, right? You always add one teaspoon of vanilla. So it doesn't vary. It doesn't have a lot of variation, co-variation in the data set. So it doesn't show up in PCA, but it is a really, really strong predictor of whether something is a cupcake or a muffin. So we get a different answer to a different question out of this analysis. Yes, Sumudu. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. not to complicate things or anything like that. So this is an OPLSD plot. So we have 9.4 variation explained by our variable that we are testing. So cupcakes or muffin. Yeah. So the orthogonal axis is 9.48. So what happens to the rest of the variability? Because it's just two plots, you have two axes uh, here, right? There's there there are other axes, right? So oh, okay. in this case, okay, there there are other orthogonal axes that I have not plotted, um, that are that are possible to make. So this is again okay. a situation it's like PCA. There are, yeah. if there's thirty variables here, there's thirty principal components. But this particular software has decided, ah, eh, you only really need to look at five of them. And there's different ways, different heuristics for picking how many axes to keep. And the same thing with, with this method, there's also different heuristics of deciding how many axes to keep. Yeah, I think it, um, it, it comes with the question, like I, I mentioned, I think before with OPLSDS, whether we should just limit orthogonal axis to one or just keep multiple orthogonal axes. So I think yeah, that yeah. It's, it's kind of the same thing. I think yeah, I just in this case, it's, it's in this case, I, I think maybe I've cut it off and said, just do okay. one axis. I can't remember. We'll take a look at it when we go through the R code example in a little Got bit. Got it. Thanks. Um, and we have some other statistics down here that I'll um, talk about maybe in more detail later. This Q squared, this is something very specific for, for PLS, um, I believe. And this is a p-value here. And this is calculated through permutation. And so now we actually have a statistic that is telling us this is a significant, statistically significant effect that cupcakes and muffins are, are different in this case. Um, and I'll talk about where that p-value comes from in a little bit. Yeah, Val, you have a question? Yeah, so uh, this is more like a terminology question, but why exactly is this supervised as opposed to not? Is it like, do you tell the data, these are muffins, these are cupcakes, find the yes. one variable that relies on it? Exactly. So, That's so exactly not, it. It knows. So unlike so the PCA, it already knows. Okay. this one knows so, whether it's cupcakes or muffins. Yeah. So what's the variable name for that? Is that no frosting or is it type? Or It's called type. Okay. Makes sense. In the no, data set. It. Yeah. There's a variable called type. So it's basically we're saying um, is type related to all the ingredients, multivariate. And so the first one, the PCA, you didn't give it the column type. You only That's gave right. it the ingredients. So it didn't know what types they were. That's right. It's just happened to be you plotted them, but the I plotted them been but done it, the, with or without. The, the math the doesn't know. Yeah. I think this makes a lot of sense for language data. Um, so sometimes you have like 
different words that people used. And it can be very confusing if you just run PCA because it spits out a bag of words that may or may not be related. But if you give it a supervised idea of what to look for, I think that might be very useful. Yeah. And so, so um, I think I wrote this out here. Yeah. So, so a thing to remember here is that these are actually answering, they're not just different methods, they're actually answering different questions, right? So in our first our first analysis, the unsupervised analysis, we're answering, we could use that to answer a question like, do cupcakes and muffins differ in the ingredients that vary most among them, right? So we, which we called leavening axis or the healthiness axis, right? So if we were actually specifically interested in a question about leavening system, and we knew sort of a priori that we, our first principal component would be leavening system, it's totally valid to, do a PCA and then plug those principal component values into a regression or something like that and get a p-value and say, yeah, they differed in their leavening system, which is principal component one. But I think more often we want to ask questions that are like, do muffins and cupcakes differ? And if so, what ingredients make them differ? And that really is something that we need a supervised analysis for that's actually looking for the separation between cupcakes and muffins and not just finding the variation in the data. Now I've chosen, I have kind of cherry picked an example here where we, we see that these two methods give very different results. Sometimes it's not always that strikingly different. And sometimes, yeah, the things that um, separate your cupcakes and muffins or whatever the analogy is in your head uh, is mapping to, sometimes that's the same thing as the main axis of variation, um, but not always. Um, so most of the time, at least for ecologists, I can say pretty confidently, you're really looking for a supervised analysis. If you have, unless you have a hypothesis that is about that main axis of variation. And so one example in, in my field in plant ecology is there's this idea of a leaf economic spectrum, which is that plants kind of vary from on the one end, they have uh, some plants will have like really thick, tough, long lived leaves that uh, kind of suck at photosynthesis. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have plants that have like rapidly growing, thin, flimsy leaves that are really good at photosynthesis. And there are plants along that continuum. And that is a principal component if you plug in a bunch of plant physiology measures at different sorts of levels of organization, you can reproduce that principal component. And so that is something you might wanna ask a question about. You might wanna say, oh, uh, does whether a plant is, you know, from Northern latitudes or Southern latitudes, does that affect where it lies on that principal component? So that's a totally valid reason to do an unsupervised analysis and then plug those principal components into some other, you know, regression or something. Um, yeah, Jessica. It sounds like though, so I was especially taken with when you first described unsupervised, that it's like, there's no equation or it's only single sided so that the PCA itself is giving you those principal, those linear combinations in the multivariate space. It's reducing them down to one, two, mm -hmm. three, five, whatever yeah. smaller number of covariates. But it uncorrelated is, covariates too. That's an important yeah. part of it. Yeah. Which just helps with the multicollinearity problem when you stick it in a regression. Yeah. But they do themselves are not, it is a, itself not really a statistical test. There is no p value. Right. You have to use it. You can use it in another statistical test. That's right. But the supervised is, I think this is about what you're getting to. That is an actual test. Like, yeah, do yeah, that's these right. two things differ when we consider like 30 characteristics about the two things? Yeah. Um, two types of things. And yeah. That is, and and there is I think that's a good that way of thinking test. of it. Yeah. That there is, there is a, a sort of natural way to do testing that's kind of built into those supervised analyses at least. Yeah. Um, okay. So. There are many R packages for that you could do multivariate analysis with, and there's no one perfect package, I am sorry to say. Um, I have struggled a lot with deciding what to demonstrate or teach in this workshop because, yeah, it's tough. So one really good one is the vegan package. This is a really good toolkit, has got a lot of functionality, um, really good documentation, a really active group of users, but the language in it in the package and in the documentation is very community ecology specific. 
So they uh, use terms like species and site, um, not only like in the documentation, but like in the code, in the, in the functions and stuff like that. And so if you're not working with species and sites, every time you learn something or use some of the code, you're going to have to translate it in your head to your particular problem. And you go, okay, wait, species is chemicals. Sites is a disease state or not, you know, something like that. And it's, it's a, it's, it's a extra cognitive load, unfortunately. Um, but if you are a community ecologist, this is a great place to go. Um, the ROPLS package is what we're going to look at today for kind of a selfish reason that it's something I'm familiar with, and I didn't have a whole lot of time to prepare for this. Um, but it only does PCA and partial least squares regression and its variants, which are supervised techniques. It's also a very funky package. Um, it very does things in a very weird way that are unlike many other R packages, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, there's the ADE4 package, which again is a really good all-purpose toolkit, has got kind of everything you need for multivariate data analysis in it, written by smart people, statisticians, but it's really, the documentation is really hard to read, and it's really meant for somebody who's like, is good at linear algebra. Um, so if that doesn't describe you, I wouldn't start with this package. But if you just need principal component analysis, you can do this in base R. This is built in with the function called PR comp. Um, and so that's actually going to be useful starting point for us. Um, okay, so now um, would be a good time to take a little bit of a break and um, get some water uh, if you need to and fire up our studio um, so that you can follow along with the next little bit if you'd like to copy and paste some code and explore on your own. All right, so uh, hopefully you've all gotten some water or something and uh, had a chance to fire up our studio um, and get that data set again. Uh, does anybody need that code for the data set? Sorry, that URL is really long, uh, but it's here. And I'll copy and paste that one more time, that code into the chat, just in case people have not gotten it. Okay, you should be able to see our studio now. Um, and so, um, yeah, one of the things we want to do is get rid of the column type and recipe ID. We don't need those for doing PCA because PCA doesn't care about those things. Um, it do you want to make the text a little bigger? Columns. Sorry. Oh, yeah, absolutely. How's that? Good. Also, the new pipe doesn't work for me. Oh, let's Should I just change use the this one, but... to the Heidiverse style pipe. I might just be um, out of date. My bad. <laughs> and uh, we can use, this is dplyr code, we can use to get rid of the type and recipe ID um, uh, things here. And so now we have a, a, a data set called just ingredients that we can do PCA with. Um, and then there's my slides. They came back. Yeah. So if you haven't seen this before, uh, in our version 4.1, I want to say, they introduced now a pipe that works very much like the one in the, the tidyverse packages. Um, and so it puts whatever's on the left into the first slot of the function that's on its right. Um, so it lets us kind of write these nice Write, write code in nice ways. Um, and then all we do to do a PCA is use this PR comp function. Um, and here it has an argument, scale period. Uh, and Siri thought I was talking to her. Uh, scale period equals true. Um, we, wanna, we want that to be true. It's usually a good idea to scale and center your variables. And I'll show you what that means. Um, you can do that outside of the PR comp function if you want. So uh, but first I'll just show you what the output looks like here. So if we do this PR comp, um, actually if I do it without assigning to anything first, uh, that over here, we get um, this. This is what the output looks like. 
standard deviations, rotation, it gives us a whole bunch of stuff. And these are related to the scores and the loadings um, that we showed before, but we're actually gonna assign that to an object. Um, and I'll show you what the scale thing does here. So ingredients, we see that some of these ingredients are gonna be on really different scales. Like, um, you know, if we go to flour, these are gonna be larger numbers than say baking soda, because we generally use teaspoons of baking soda and we use, you know, cups of flour. And so if we want to use this in PCA, um, it's a good idea to scale it. Otherwise, the, you know, sort of larger numbers are going to dominate because they're going to have larger variants and they're going to dominate that PCA. So if we use scale, you can see it just centers and scales them so that every column has uh, uh, adds up to zero and um, uh, is scaled by the standard deviation of that column. So that's what scale does. We don't have to do it ahead of time. We could, we could scale our ingredients um, list and, and make it into a matrix and put that into PR comp and have scale equals true equals false. But I like to just let PR comp do it for me. Um, that's doing PCA. And then if we use summary, we can take a look at it. Um, and we see for every principal component uh, through 29, because I guess there's 29 variables, it shows us the proportion of the standard deviation for that, the proportion of variance that is explained by that component. And so you see it starts uh, the, the highest amount is 13.4%, and then it keeps going down all the way down to PC29, which is off the charts, explaining no additional variation in the data. Um, and we see the cumulative proportion of variance is explained. So by the time we get to five components, we're explaining about 50% of the variation. And by the time we get to uh, 10 components, it's explaining about 80% of the variation in the data, um, and 14 components is explaining about 90% of the variation in the data. So we don't need 29 axes to describe our data set. We can get away with much less than that uh, if we're willing to you know, only explain half the variation or 80% of the variation. And like I said, there's sort of different heuristics for how to decide how many axes you want to sort of retain. Um, yeah, uh, Thomas. Yeah, so uh, the following PC uh, principal components explains additional variation for your data, right? So it, it's like account for the variation that is already there. That's why it's decreasing with the number of principal components. Is that right? Yeah, because just the way that PCA works is the first component is always gonna, going to be that line that we drew, you know, from the point to the point of the football, it's going to be the one that explains the, the greatest amount of the spread, the variation in your data. The second axis is going to be, per, has to be perpendicular to that um, so that they're not correlated with each other. And it's going to aim to explain the second greatest amount of variation um, or really, you know, the greatest amount of variation while being perpendicular. Um, and so, yeah, you're always going to get just by the definition of how PCA works, uh, additional principal components explaining less and less variation of the data. Um, yeah, and like one way that you can kind of visualize this, um, if you plot it, it gives you this plot, which is called a scree plot, and each bar is a principal component, and then this is like the variance explained by that component. Sometimes you can see a really clear drop off and you're like, aha, yes, 10 components is the right amount. But most of the time I find these not terribly useful. Um, so there isn't one here. Uh, like this doesn't tell you it's the first five. Like, no, shows. I, I mean, no, I don't see, there's nothing that pops out at me here that tells me how many principal components I should retain. So that was from a different package then. Yeah, and that's the, we'll we'll okay. we'll do that with the ROPLS package. And one final, um, and, just a tiny little weird thing. Yeah. Uh, if you happen to know why, why is it scale dot equals true? I think most of the arguments <laughs> I see are just scale equals or something. 
Yeah. Um, probably. And, okay. I can think of two maybe? reasons. There's two possible reasons. Yes. So here's the reason. Dot, dot, dot. So um, they're, they're, the, the reason is, is that they're pretty certain that no one else is going to make a, a, a method for PR comp. And I'll talk about what methods are in a second. That's going to have an argument called scale dot that will conflict with this one. It's a bad reason. It's, oh. <laughs> it's just, it's just a weird quirk of, of, uh, of, of R. Um, huh. Yeah. Um, but that's my guess. Okay. Visualizing the results. So our options for like built-in plots, not great. Um, we have the by plot function. You already saw that plot doesn't make a score plot. Um, so by plot does this, which uh, since I've zoomed my screen in is even worse than what's on the slides. It's very over plotted, but it basically is plotting the scores and the loadings at the same time. So it's like those two separate plots I showed you, but on top of each other, uh, which is sometimes kind of nice because you can like, you know, associate particular recipes with particular ingredients um, visually. Um, the numbers here are just going to be the rows of the data set. Um, yeah. We're not going to go into plotting uh, in this workshop very much. Um, it's something we can definitely follow up on. I've added here just this is how you would get the data out of the PCA if you wanted to make your own plot. Um, and I will share with you afterwards the code that I used for making the plots that we saw, um, although I can't promise that it will be easy to understand or 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 follow necessarily. Um, yeah. So um, if you'd like to try, um, you can also, uh, you can try this with the Palmer Penguins package. This is a, just a data package that has a data set called Penguins in it. Um, and uh, how, how are we, how, how's everybody feeling? Do we want to take um, a few moments to try this out with a different package? or um, give me maybe a thumbs up if you wanna do that, or if you'd rather, um, yeah, okay. So I see a couple of thumbs up. Why don't we take a moment to try this out on your own? Um, I'll let you guys uh, play around with this. I have here a tip. Um, some of these rows have NAs in them and PCA cannot handle NAs. So you're gonna have to get rid of them in whatever way you feel comfortable with. Um, one possibility is this drop NA function. Um, okay, I'll shut up for a few minutes. Um, so question, I'm try just trying to prep this, but it, it looks like the only thing that we've done so far is the PR comp, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Oh. So um, the I guess the, the steps that we need to do though are first figure out what columns we wanna use as our data. So in this data set, there's, um, some you know numeric stuff and some non-numeric stuff. So for our PCA, we want to use just the uh, the bill length, the the bill depth, the flipper length, and the body mass. Um, we can't put uh, factors like male or female into PCA, and uh, year doesn't make any sense to put into PCA. Right. So um, Got it. so the the kind of steps are get your data set, right. Select the columns that you want. Um, get rid of any rows that are that have NAs in them and then PR comp on it. And once you've gotten to that point, um, if you could give me the green check mark on Zoom, that way I kind of know um, when we're ready to. Are we doing summary also? Sure, yeah. If you want to run a summary on it, that'd be great. Okay, well, I'm gonna, um, I think I will go ahead and just real quick, Maybe type what I would do, and then we'll move on. So I'm going to load the Palmer Penguins package. I'm going to make sure that the data is accessible just by typing penguins and running that. Um, and then we're going to go uh, penguins. And we're going to use we'll use the tidyverse pipe there. Um, we want to. Select, we want to get rid of species. We want to get rid of island. 
we want to get rid of sex, and we want to get rid of year. And then we want to drop an A. If I run that, I should get, yep, just the ingredients. Um, and let's save that as X, capital X, for reasons that will make some little bit of sense a little bit later. And then if we do PR comp on that big X, uh, let's save that. Penguin underscore PCA, something like that. And then we can do summary penguin underscore PCA. Cool. Um, yep. Oh, I didn't scale it. That's why mine is different. Scale true. Yeah, there we go. That's better. And just for fun, see what the by plot looks like. Yeah. Unreadable, <laughs> but uh, question about that actually because it looks so. I mean, PCA one that explains six PCA two only explains a smaller percent, a much smaller percentage. Why does the like visually looking at all those numbers stack there? It looks th like there's more variation up and down than left to right. Is that just? Am I just not reading it correctly? Um. Or am I so not this is not plotting the original data. This is plotting the the principal components, right? So, but the points um, shouldn't they be the if, if it's through the football, the longest part of longest line through the football? Shouldn't the football be arrayed along PC one? Mm, yeah, but uh, it's that's an interesting question. I suspect it has something to do with how it's kind of scaled. Okay. Um, and so like, yeah, I don't know. Um, it's not it's, important. It just looked, I looked yeah, at it I was like, oh, it looks like the longest football is going this way. Mm, the longest yeah, yeah, yeah. line through the football. But maybe that's, these are already scaled um, data. So that's one thing harder to think about. And then these are not yeah, the raw. And I but also, the, I'm also not exactly sure how the biplot function scales the data to plot it. So, okay. Um, okay. Hmm, yeah. Scratch that. <laughs> Scratch <laughs> Interesting that. question. Yes. Uh, okay. So let us, let us move on. Um, so now we'll do the same thing with this ROPLS package. So this is, like I've said, it's, I have a, I have a love hate relationship with it. It's a very nice package in a lot of ways because it includes a lot of model diagnostics and mutation test statistics and a lot of sort of default stuff that's really nice that you don't have to figure out how to do on your own. It makes decent plots. You could probably make them publication quality. Um, uh, I still prefer to sort of make my own plots, but you could use this package for it. Downsides are it's a bioconductor package. Um, uh, if you don't... How, who, who knows what bioconductor is? Raise your hand if you know what bioconductor is or have installed a package from there. Um, I'm going to assume a couple people have, but not everyone. Um, so there's like an extra layer of stuff to do there. So to install the ROPLS package, if we, if we were to just did like we did before and click here, click install ROPLS, it's not found, uh, doesn't exist. Uh, oops, that's telling me I need to restart. But if you try to install it through CRAN, it's going to tell you it doesn't exist. So actually what you have to do for Bioconductor, uh, so Bioconductor is a, is a nice resource. It is a, another place that houses our packages that are specifically related to sort of, um, a lot of them are like uh, omics kinds of um, uh, uh, packages for analyzing biological data. But we have to install a package to install packages. So we need to install a package called Bioc Manager. So if you don't have this installed, you'll need to install Bioc Manager um, first. And then you can use the Bioc Manager package, has a function in it called install that you can use to install bioconductor packages. So I'm guessing, um, with the exception of maybe maybe Sumudu, that you don't have ROPLS installed yet. So um, if you'd like to follow along with this section, 
Um, these are the important things to do. Oops, uh, to install uh, the Bioc Manager package and then use Bioc Manager to install our OPLS. You can also just, if you have the slides open, you can just copy and paste this um, into R and it should, should work. This first little bit is just some code saying like, don't install it if you already have it installed. It asks if we should install uh, or update some packages with it, like also um, none. Any recommendations? Yeah, you for can. That? You can. I would say none for the case of the workshop. Um, it's just like a just a little reminder that when you install stuff, it's reminding you, hey, you have other packages that you haven't updated in a while, but you don't. You don't have to. I'm gonna assume we've all got it kind of installed. So here's one of the weird things about this package, one of these sort of not very R-like things. There's just one function. <laughs> uh, not really. I mean, there's multiple functions in the package, but there's one function called OPLS that does PCA, PLS, PLSDA, OPLSDA. It does a bunch of different things depending on what arguments you give it. So if we give it just our ingredients, it does PCA. Um, and so what that looks like, We have ingredients here, and we have our uh, OPLS. We see that the, the in the little pop-up thingy here, the first argument is X, that X equals ingredients. We get this. Um, cool. So this is what PCA looks like from the ROPLS package. First off, it tells us we have 30 samples and 29 variables. That's nice to remember. Um, it gives us our R squared X. This is our um, cumulative variation explained um, that I showed before. So 51% of the variation explained and pre is uh, a, a misnomer here, it's predictive, <laughs> and ORT is orthogonal. Um, and that's because, well, these make sense when you're doing PLS. They don't, those names don't really make sense for PCA, but this is our number of components that it's retained. And so you can read the help files for this if you're interested, but it has some, some algorithms that it uses to decide how many components to retain. It also gives us some plots. Um, and uh, the first plot here, this is that scree plot. And this is just showing the percent of total variance explained by the first, in this case, five components, whatever it's decided to keep. Um, then we've got a score plot down here. Now it's not colored in any way. These labels are just, I believe the row labels, so like S6 is like sample six, right? So it's the sixth row. You could look at our data set and figure out what recipe that is if we wanted to. Um, but we've got our score plot. And then over here, we've got a loading plot, which is um, similar to the correlation plot, gives us the same information. Uh, the axes are a little different. These are no longer correlation coefficients. These are loadings, which won't explain um, in this workshop because I don't have a good explanation for it right off the top of my head, um, but something you can read about. Um, and so it tells us, you know, again, here's our axis. We've got baking powder and milk over here, baking soda, cream cheese, other over there. This is our leavening axis again. And it also gives us this observation diagnostics plot, which um, if there were points outside of these dotted lines, those would be potential outliers. So it has like a little bit of outlier detection kind of in here um, or extreme values. Um, they're not necessarily outliers that need to be removed, but it's, you know, something to look into. Um, oftentimes, if you have a lot of things out here, it's because you didn't, the data didn't get scaled correctly or something like that. Um, we can make a better score plot, though. Um, and we can do that with the plot function. And so uh, I will just show this real quick. Um, so here's our baked. PCA, boom. And if we go plot baked PCA, it makes this. 
And so now you might be wondering, well, how do I customize this? How do I know what arguments I can give it? If I look for the help file for plot um, by typing question mark plot and running that, well, I just see generic XY plotting. And well, that doesn't really tell me anything. It just tells me X, Y, dot, dot, dot. Um, so this is a little R lesson here. So plot is a type of function um, that's called a generic. And so when you run plot, what's actually happening is it's figuring out what class of data um, or what, what kind of object baked PCA is. And then it's not running a default plot method. It's running a plot method specific for that type of data. So how do we find the help file for this? There are a couple ways. One is to figure out what object that uh, object class that baked PCA is. And so if we run the class function on it, it tells us that it has the class OPLS. Then we could see, for example, what methods are available for OPLS. And we see this list. So print, predict, plot, these are all base R functions, but they do something different when the object class is OPLS. And then finally, if we want to see the help file for a specific, um, for, the, for the method that's specific for OPLS, for plot function, we actually look for a function called plot period OPLS. So plot.opls brings us to a different help page that is specifically about the plot function when you use it on an OPLS object. The other way that you could come across this kind of thing um, is if you look for the help for the package. So if we look for the ROPLS package in this packages pane and click on the name, it takes us to all the help pages for that package. And we could kind of scroll down and see that there's print.opls, there's plot.opls. So these are all methods that are specific um, for this kind of object. So if we look at this plot method for OPLS DA function, we see another reason why this package is a little weird. The arguments, the names, oh boy, no human can remember this. Uh, <laughs> the whoever, the, the, this is designed, it's supposed to be informative. So this is a parameter um, that makes something be a color, has color, and it accepts factors or vectors that are numeric. That's where that name comes from. Um, but I have to look it up every single time. So let's go back to the slides. Um, so here's some code that you can use to customize your plot a little bit. So type VC. If we want a score plot, we tell it X score. And we can color it by cupcake versus muffin by giving it this par as coal uh, parameter. And we give it that column from our baked goods data set called type. And that has the the indicator of whether it's a cupcake or a muffin in it. Um, and OK, let me just check on the chat. I see Ryan's got Biac Manager installed and ROPLS installed. Oh, yeah, good, good. Good point, Jessica. I missed a step. You got to load the library, of course. Um, load ROPLS, and then everything should work. Cool. So this is how you customize the plots. Um, we can get a correlation plot, and there are several other types of plots we can get. Um, and you have to look for the help for plot.opls to figure out all the customization options. Um, and there's a lot. There's a lot you can do. Like I said. You can use this to make publication quality plots. Um, it's possible. They're not going to look the best, maybe, but they're going to be fine. So now, how do we do our supervised analysis? So partial least squares regression is sometimes called PLS or PLSR. This is a supervised multivariable, multivariable technically technique. Um, it is very good at handling multicollinearity. So if we have lots of predictors that are correlated, it's good at handling the situation where you have more variables and observations. 
Uh, it's great. It does a good job at those things. Um, when your response variable, uh, your Y variable is categorical, example, uh, it's a cupcake or a muffin, then it does PLS discriminant analysis. So the DA there is for discriminant analysis. Um, you can totally do it with continuous variables too, though. Um, and it's just going to give you a little bit of different output plots and statistics. Um, to do this, we use exactly the same function, but we give it an X and a Y this time. So a little funky, um, but if I copy that and put that in here, let's make a new, new code chunk. Boom. Uh, if we run that now, it does PLS. Um, but hey, that's weird. Look what it tells us. Warning, single component model, only overview and permutation plots available. That is because it has decided that one component, one axis is plenty to explain the difference between cupcakes and muffins. And so it has decided to make a single component model, which is great, which is fine, but it doesn't give us any plots we can look at, right? And so, um, because you can't plot anything with just one axis, uh, it gives us these two plots, which I'll talk about later what they are. Um, another thing to notice here, this is a data frame, ingredients. This has to be a vector. So uh, I can't give it, uh, the, 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 this is how I have to do it. I have to use baked goods dollar sign type to get just that type column out of there as a vector. Um, okay, so yeah, we get this single component model and what can we do? Uh, so there is a related method called orthogonal PLS DA. This finds a single predictive axis that separates two categories. Other axes are orthogonal. They're not related to it. Usually OPLS DA is, is not the best idea, at least not to start with, but when there's a single predictive axis, it's very useful because it gives us other axes so that we have something to plot, we have something to visualize. And to do OPLSDA, it's again, exactly the same function. We, for pred i, this is predictive integer, I think. <laughs> we tell it we want exactly one predictive axis. Um, and ortho i, we tell it na. Uh, how do I know this? I read the help file. Um, it does explain how to do this in the help file. But if we copy that and paste it, now we get more stuff <laughs> and we have something we can plot. And this is basically what I showed in the slides at the beginning. So we've got some new stuff here. R squared X, that's the same. This is the proportion of variance in the data, in the ingredients explained by the axes. In this case, it decided there should be one predictive axis and only one orthogonal axis um, through its algorithm. We also have this R squared Y cumulative. And this um, is useful if you have more than one predictive axis. In this case, we only had one. So it's exactly the same as the, um, well, no, sorry. So, so this value, this 9%, this is how much variation in the ingredients is explained by this axis, but the R squared Y is how much of the uh, separation between cupcakes and muffins is explained. This is more equivalent to an R squared from a regression, right? It's like how much, how much of the response is variation in the response is explained by your, you know, linear model or whatever. In this case, it's this multivariate technique. We also have this thing called Q squared. Q squared is a number that is uh, created through cross-validation. Um, essentially, it is the higher it is, the better. The closer it is to R squared Y, the better. It will never be larger than R squared Y. It's um, giving you information about the predictive power of the model. Um, RMSEE -E is root mean squared error of something. I can't remember what the other E stands for. This is how many predictive axes, how many orthogonal axes. And then these P values are calculated through permutation. And so essentially what this does is it shuffles the labels in your data. 
So instead of having those cupcake muffin, cupcake muffin, that type data set, it randomizes that, reruns your model, um, calculates an R squared Y and a Q squared. And it does this however many times you want it to. I think the default is like 200. It does it 200 times by default. And then this number, this P value is what percentage or what proportion of the randomly shuffled values give you an R squared that is greater than the R squared you get from your real data. And that's our P value. It's just the proportion of random permuted uh, data sets that give you a better value than the real data. So if there's a really shitty relationship uh, in here and not very much variations explained, you might get a bigger R squared just by chance um, than what you get from the real data. And this p-value would be larger. Um, oh yeah, this is the slide where I type out the things I just said. <laughs> Uh, let's see if I miss anything. Yeah, those are the permutation test values. So you probably want to increase the number of permutations. So perm i, we can make it 999. Or 1,000 or whatever you want to make it. Um, we want to make it more. You notice that the code is going to take a lot longer to run when we do that. So we probably don't want to do that for kind of just figuring things out. But now over here, we have a much more sensible p-value, um, a much more sort of like precise one, I guess. Um, so our p-value here is 0 0.005 for the, the r squared y. And for q squared, it's 0 0.001. So those are p-values we could report. Um, and we can also customize the plot for that and make a score and um, correlation plot. Um, and there's some code here for how to do that that I won't go into in detail. Yeah, Ryan, it's a little bit slow sometimes. Actually, I'm not sure when you sent that, if you're talking about the permutation test, but yeah, um, it can be slow. I caught up, um, we're good. Good. So, you know, we have um, some time now um, where if you'd like to, we can um, take some time to try it out with the uh, Penguins data set, try doing PLS um, and PCA with that Penguins data set like we did uh, with the, the cupcakes and muffins to sort of answer the question if the penguins um, have different morphology by species, if the different species of penguins have different morphology. Um, and so we can try that. Um, I'm also happy to just like open up the floor for discussion if we want to do that with the last bit of time. Um, I just have, there's a few more slides that I want to end with to make sure you guys know how to get more help and read more about this stuff um, and how to you know, contact us again. Um, but I guess I'll pause here and, and kind of leave it up to you guys what you want to do. If you'd rather, uh, if you want to spend the time trying to do some R code, we can do that. Um, if you want to spend some time talking about your particular data challenges or whatever, we can do that. I have a question. <clears throat> I haven't ever heard of like the PLSDA. I forget what that actually yep. stands for. I've seen for I've seen um like like PCA a lot, but I've never seen like the 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 supervised method. I don't think. So I'm yeah. mostly read ecology kind of papers. Do you see that a lot or where is that popular or is it newer or so it... yeah I learned about it through so my background is a chemical ecologist going to conferences and it seemed like something that was really popular among folks that did um, analysis of like metabolomics of um, chemical compositions because there you you very often have you know hundreds of variables and much less than hundreds of observations. And those hundreds of variables are often really strongly correlated. And so it was, it's a good technique for that. But I don't see it a lot in ecology. Um, the, the supervised method that I see, the two supervised methods that pop up the most in ecology, I would say, are redundancy analysis, which is RDA is, is the acronym, and canonical correspondence analysis, which is CCA. Those are the two supervised, or they call them generally constrained in, in ecology fields. 
Um, those are the constrained analyses that I see the most, or actually like MANOVA, you know, um, multivariate analysis variance. There's a, there's a, a, a permutational version of it, like a non-parametric permanova permutational uh, multivariate analysis of variance. Is, it, is that right? Something like that. That's what that stands for. Those are the ones that show up the most commonly, I think, in ecology. Um, oh, yeah, okay. I, I was considering putting a slide of like, most common unsupervised and supervised techniques that you'll see in the literature, but I, I realize that it's going to be a biased view from the literature I read. It's going to be not exhaustive. And so like, I can't make that list for you. Um, but uh, I can, I can point you to a, some other resources that will be helpful um, for figuring out, you know, what's used in your field. One of the, one of the things about all these methods though, is that, you know, okay, so why is, why is PLSDA not used in ecology? I don't know that there's a particularly great reason that it's not that common. It's just like things catch on, you know, and people like hear about it from other people and there's discipline, like unnecessary, like discipline barriers. Like I was talking about with the vegan package, like it uses this really discipline specific language, even though you can totally do, you can totally use it for analyzing whatever kind of data you want, as long as it's like appropriate for the method. It doesn't have to be species and sites. So I think sometimes we just get a little bit siloed and, and people just don't like, start aware of the, the methods that are available in, in other fields that might be applicable to them. Um, is anybody um, trying the uh, analysis with the penguins package? Want to report in or Jessica, you're trying it out? Try it out. Um, don't really know what I'm looking at. <laughs> uh, um, this is not the, all right, yeah, because the last one, I guess we kind of forced it to be orthogonal or something. Yeah, I don't and think we can do isn't. that with this one. Um, so if we do, I just called it big X, I think. So that's the PCA, which tells us there's one axis. Uh, so that's not very helpful, right? Um, but it, let's see if we do, uh, penguins dollar sign species. Oh, the, this is going to come. The number of rows isn't going to be correct. So I had to do a little. Yeah, we have to do that. this drop NA thing. Yeah, but you want to select the data. You have to select the same columns as before and drop because it drops too much oh. that way. Anyways, took a little while. Select, uh, what is it, Bill? Bill I Wayne. think you just want to drop island, sex, and year, and you'll be good. Depth, uh, body mass, flipper length. And you want to keep species in this one too. I think. Oh yeah, and species. And then drop an A. And then, and then this and then is hang to, uh, oh, I see. Move that down. Okay. And then this is minus species. Uh -huh. And then this is Hang two species. species. Yeah, there you what go. What do we see? Yes. So oh, this okay. is PLSDA. And so in this case, there's three species, um, not just two. So it's, and there's multiple, it's finding that there's three predictive axes um, that explain the variation among species, the difference among species. So the biggest difference is, is predictive axis one, um, which is separating the gen two out from the other two. And then the second biggest um, axis there is axis two, which is separating out, looks like the, the chin strap and the, the Adelie penguins. So that's kind of what we're looking at there. Um, and um, if we do it with more permutations, we'll, we'll see if that's a significant difference or not. Um, I think it is. And yeah. So uh, let's let that run a little bit. I'll tell you what the p-value is in a second. 
Uh, I have a quick question. I got sure. some spit back. Maybe it's just another library, but it's the basically a last line. Um, it's uh, basically says error in add column bind coals get score nm or mn. Uh, basically, it said it can't find the function add column. So, am I missing a library? Oh, in the in the uh, uh, in this. Yeah. Yeah, add column is in. Just do library tidyverse to get them all. I Dude, okay. yeah, I which ones are which? Okay. Yeah, I would just yeah. It's oh, I guess it's in the tibble, tibble. package. <laughs> so yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. I'm um, running cloud, so it's. Oh sure. And, I, and it's a new session, so. Oh yeah, one more thing I'll just demonstrate to you guys, which is a, another weird thing about these uh, about this package um, is, so we have this 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 OPLS object. Um, normally, if I want to like get stuff out of an object or explore it, I use the dollar sign. Uh, for these, we have to use the at symbol. Um, so this is a <laughs> a type of thing called S4. Uh, you don't need to know what it is, but there's an at symbol. Uh, so that's probably new um, to many of you. Um, basically, you're not really supposed to use this at symbol. You're supposed to use um, accessor functions. So there's functions in the ROPLS package, to, like get the scores, get the loading stuff out of this for plotting. And that's this get score MN, um, get loading MN. But you can also get to them by typing that at symbol and like exploring the object. Um, okay, I will kind of wrap up a little bit here. Um, first by saying thank you all for coming and attending um, the workshop. It was really cool hearing a little bit about what you all do and um, hopefully this was helpful for you and um, uh, uh, helps you at least kind of figure out where to go next for help on your multivariate analysis issues. Um, we have drop-in hours on uh, Tuesday mornings that you are welcome to come by. They're virtual. So just, you know, come by if you have questions about multivariate statistics. I'm there every week. You can also send us an email at cct-datascience at arizona.edu. You can book an appointment with me or, or Jessica or Christina. Um, but if you want to talk about multivariate stats or this workshop, you can book an appointment with me at our um, contact page. Um, and also want to let you know about our incubator program a little bit. Um, if you have a, a, an analysis project that you know requires some analysis of multivariate data, making of custom plots, something like that, you might be a good candidate for this. Um, we have some internal funding to provide um, uh, some time, some of our time to work on these sort of smaller um, data science projects. Um, so check that out if you think you might have a project for us that would uh, be a good collaboration. And then I also want to just leave you here with this last slide of kind of further reading places to look. Um, again, the vegan package has great documentation. Our OPLS package has pretty good documentation. Um, CRAN has this task view on multivariate statistics. It's a little bit outdated, but it's it's a fairly comprehensive list of like all the R packages on CRAN that do stuff with multivariate data. Um, the ideas I talked about with the cupcakes versus muffins and supervised versus unsupervised, I've written as a blog post. Um, so that's a great venue if you want to share that with uh, lab mates or collaborators or something like that um, in kind of like a fun short form uh, way. Um, this is a paper I really highly recommend by Hervé et al. Um, it's written for chemical ecologists, but even if you're not a chemical ecologist, I think it's really, really good. Um, and it gives examples of different types of multivariate analyses for different situations, has a nice flow chart of like, if your data is like this, this is what you should do. And best of all, it has R code and data in the supplementary materials. It actually runs and works um, and reproduces all the plots and stuff in the paper. Super, super good paper. I'll also point you to uh, this paper that, that, that I co-authored um, that is also kind of about the ideas that I talked about here using supervised analyses. Um, in this, we, we don't use the cupcakes and muffins data set, but we use a real ecological data set as well as some simulated data to show kind of the consequences of using the wrong 
quote unquote wrong method for the question for the data. Um, and we also do like a little mini review to figure out um, kind of getting at what Leah was asking is like, what are people, what are, what do ecologists use in terms of uh, multivariate data analyses? Um, and then this is a nice book um, that is probably one that, you know, would be the, the book for a course if you were to take a multivariate analysis course, but it's also good for just some reference. If you have, um, you know, questions, you can, uh, uh, look through the the table of contents and and figure out what part you want to read maybe. Um, so that's it. Um, I'm happy to answer any more questions. I can stick around for a little bit, but I'll go ahead and stop the recording here. And then, uh, uh, yeah, you're welcome to stick around, take off, play around more with the the penguins, ask questions, whatever you want. So thanks. <laughs>